having her first baby. Uh, as you can see, for, for women 25 to 29 years, it's been decreasing. The yellow is 1990, whereas red is 2002. And from an epidemiology perspective, 12 years is really a short time. Such a change in 12 years in a society is remarkable. And as you can see, for women 30 to 34 year old, uh, the first birth rate has been increasing, the same for 35 to 39, and same for 40 to 44. This means that the, if the patient had a breast cancer at age 38, she's now more likely that to, have, uh, you know, to want to have a baby in the future. Do we need better education of our patients? This is one of the reasons, I guess, you know, I'm here uh, to have better communication with your community and ours. 60% of women, survivors of diagnosed with cancer in young adulthood recall discussing cancer-related infertility, which means 40% do not. When they surveyed 162 oncologists in two major cancer centers, 90% agreed uh, that all men whose fertility could be impaired should be offered sperm banking, but 50% never or rarely addressed this topic. And male fertility preservation, which is not the subject of my talk, is really easy for uh, adult men. When they surveyed 697 women diagnosed with breast cancer before the age of 40, 72% discussed infertility with their physician, only 17% consulted an infertility specialist, and only half of them were happy with their discussions. And sometimes when I talk about this thing with lay people, they will say, you know, are you doing a really good thing for the society by bringing this up when a woman with cancer, you know, do they really want to have a baby? Who would want to have a baby if they have cancer? These are uh, answers to those questions from Schoeller, who's a really good researcher in this field. She is a social worker. Three out of four women who's been diagnosed with cancer do want to have a baby in the future. Four out of five think uh, having had cancer would make them a better parent. Two out of three would want a baby even if they could die young. And only less than 10% would choose adoption because of potential risk of um, increased risk of cancer in, the, in their babies. So what are the options? And I'll try to go through them during this talk. There are four options. Two of them are established, and this is only for the last uh, six months that the second one is now an established treatment option in the United States. Up until October 2012, this was considered an experimental. Now, it is not an experimental method. It is an established method of fertility preservation. So we have two that are established and two that are experimental. First, we'll talk about embryo cryopreservation. Um, this is uh, basically when we generate embryos in IVF. We don't use all of them. Sometimes we generate, as in cases of fertility preservation, we only make the embryos to, to basically store them. Uh, we really know how to do this because we do this a lot. We do it almost, almost every IVF cycle, which we do 150,000 times a year in the United States. So this is really a common use protocol. There are almost 20,000 cycles of embryo cryopreservation transfer in the United States. Survival rate for thawed embryo is up to 9% these days. So when we freeze an embryo and thaw it, 90% of the time the embryo will do fine. And the success rates when we do transfer those embryos, and success is generally defined as pregnancy. Uh, some people would define it as live birth, which is a, a better number, but mostly as pregnancy. And it's around 25%, which is quite good. So one out of four women undergoing transfer with a frozen embryo will end up having, being pregnant. Although this is very successful, there's a few issues with it. One of them is that the woman who's diagnosed with cancer would, should have a partner or should accept and find a sperm donor within the short period of time that is available to her. Secondly, we need to stimulate the ovaries in order to get the eggs, and that may cause a delay in the treatment. And the third issue is when we stimulate the ovaries, we tend to have uh, elevated estrogen. And for some cancers, especially oncologists, but even us, we, we don't really like elevated estrogens for uh, cancers that are susceptible to estrogen. So some of research, some key people in this uh, work try to establish protocols that will work without elevating the estrogen. And tamoxifen, although it is used as an anti-cancer agent, it can also be used to ovulate patients because it works as an anti-oestrogen and the brain thinks, oh, there's not enough oestrogen, let me stimulate the ovaries more and brain makes more FSH and 
causes uh, ovarian stimulation. The same thing can be done with letrozole, which is an aromatase inhibitor, the, an inhibitor of the enzyme that regulates estrogen making. So they try to combine these with the stimulating hormone or use them alone. Using alone didn't really work. Uh, when you combine, it really worked well, especially with the aromatase inhibitor that prevents the rise in estrogen when it's combined with the, with the hormone that makes the eggs. I'll just go to this. And this is the paper which we all use now as a protocol. And when they used letrozole plus FSH, they achieved 12 eggs, which is similar to the control where they were 11 eggs and with an estrogen of only 480 compared to 1400. So low estrogen, equal number of eggs, and if you want to know what this is compared to a normal estrogen in a normal cycle, it's, it's almost only double of normal, and only for a few days. So a lot of people agree is that this is an acceptable increase in estrogen for only a few days, even in a breast cancer patient. The second um, procedure is all side core preservation, freezing the eggs. Now, I spend my days and nights thinking and working about eggs. I love it. It's, I think it's the most interesting cell in the body. It is. <laughs> and people, well, we can, we're all, a lot of the information that we have now directly comes from the egg. And anyway, there's a problem with the egg though. It's too big. There's too much water in it. And when you try to freeze it, it kind of makes crystals. And also, in addition to all these things, in the egg there's something called a spindle. There's a little ropes on which the chromosomes are lined up. And if you break those, you cause abnormalities in the babies. So freezing the egg has not been easy. But uh, you'll know all about it by the end of this talk. So it's large, there's chromosomes. Oh, there's another thing. The egg has a shell, even the human egg. It's called zona pellucida. And they started freezing them. It was getting so hard that sperm wouldn't get in. So finally, someone came up with a very brilliant idea, which is like taking this sperm and sticking it into the egg. And it worked. And now the fertilization rates for frozen eggs is almost 100%. So we have two ways of freezing the eggs, and it's very easy. It's either slow or fast. Fast is called vitrification. This is what you use. You put the egg into this. You collect it here. And when we freeze eggs, it's kind of like if you ever ate uh, salmon from Ikea, where you know it tastes really good because they put it into a salty outline so that the water comes out and it becomes more and more dense. So that's what you do to the egg. Is it salmon from Ikea? Yeah, the salmon Gravelax, the, the Swedish salmon, which is very tasty because they take the water out. The, you know, the concentration of the taste increases if you get the water out, basically. So that's what you do to the egg. You put it into a solution where there's a lot of um, chemicals that cannot get into the egg, so the water from the egg comes out, egg shrinks, you freeze it, you don't cause crystals, and then you take it and plunge it into liquid nitrogen. This is how you take it, this is how you plunge it, and then you store it. This is slow freezing. I only have one slide because this has been a long discussion for the past 15 years. We know who is the winner. We know vitrification is the way to go. This was too cumbersome and the results suggest that doing it fast actually works better. This is something we re recently prepared. We didn't publish this. Slow freezing, all data available as you can see from 2004 to 2012. Uh, the black is the live birth rate, the gray is the clinical pregnancy. There's not a huge change or increase. Whereas uh, you can see this is the vitrification, non-donor cycles. Uh, you see the black, is, there is a trend and the gray also. There's been a significant increase in the success rates. And the live birth rates using vitrified frozen eggs is now as good as fresh in the good centers. And this is, I'm sorry for the, you know, size of this, but I'll only show two things. There's only one randomized trial comparing these two, and it shows that vitrification is better than slow freezing here, uh, from 38% to 21%. And Kobo from Spain is a good friend, and she had like 50,000 cycles. She showed that when you use donor eggs, which is healthy women freezing their eggs, doing it fresh versus vitrifying the egg does not matter. They're equally successful. So what I'm trying to say is, we know how to do this, and this is one of the options that will be offered to your patients if you refer to them. And using the newly developed stimulation techniques, we can get it done in three weeks. So you call, you get her in 25 or 48 hours, we get the eggs in three weeks, she comes come back for medication. Can you just stop for one second? Yeah. How many clinicians here knew that you could do that in three weeks? Okay, Dr. Stamps, but that's actually an incredibly important point. 
Because I think that changes people's attitudes toward the importance of getting this done. Three weeks. It's done. Thank you. So uh, what is good about oocyte cryopreservation? preservation? Oocyte cryopreservation preservation does not require a partner. Now, I know you have much more experience with cancer patients than I do, but I sometimes see them referred from you and they come with their significant other, the people they're dating, etc. And then they sometimes don't want to use uh, the sperm of that person to make embryos and freeze them. Actually, sometimes they say, can I talk to you? In person later on, they come back and they say, you know what, I don't want to make embryos. I want to just freeze my eggs. So ownership in a patient with cancer is very, very important because you know who that egg belongs to, whereas when there's an embryo, it gets complicated. This is actually one of the reasons why all site cryopreservation has been developed to start with the ownership issue. And there are also s uh, some religious concerns for, from certain religions. So it doesn't require surgery like some other options. Established simulation protocols can be used. Again, there are ethical advantages for certain people. Legal ownership is very clear. It does cause a delay, as I said, around three weeks or so. And it used to be low pregnancy rates, but it's not anymore. Okay, I think I'm doing good. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation is an experimental strategy. It's very interesting. Uh, NIH spent probably more than $50 million in the last year or so for to improve this. Uh, we have, we're still struggling to make good eggs from small follicles, uh, but there is some improvement. The good news about the ovarian cortex is that the eggs there are small, so you can freeze them without injury. And, um, and generally, you cut a small piece, one to three millimeter thick and one square centimeter area, and you can do slow or fast, and you have three options. One, you can freeze them and thaw them and try to make eggs from the frozen tissue, which is not working yet, despite all, all the money spent. Or you can take the thawed tissue, and once the patient recovers from cancer, you can put it back. When you put it back, you have two options. You can either put it back anywhere you want, or you can put it back to where you took it from. So if you put it back to where the ovary was, you call it orthotopic transplantation. If you put it back somewhere else, it's called heterotopic transplantation. The so first work from this came from Octai. Uh, uh, from, he used to be in Cornell. What they did is you know, they, they took the tissue after the cancer treatment. They put it back into the arm like this. They stimulated the patient with follicle stimulating hormone, make the egg in the arm like this. You see the ultrasound of the egg in the arm. They got the egg out of the arm, fertilized in vitro with the sperm, grew it in, in vitro, uh, sorry about that, grew it in vitro and transferred. Uh, it was, I think, a five cell grade two embryo. It did not cause a pregnancy. And heterotopic transplantation has advantages because you can easily see where it is, etc but there has not been a live birth from this approach yet. The one that worked, and this first case was published at Lancet from a French group. It was a Hodgkin's lymphoma patient. Um, you know, he got the treatment, she, she received the treatment, had amenorrhea, hormone replacement treatment for two and a half years. And then they took the tissue, thawed it, and put it back to where they took it from. This is uh, immunostaining for an oocyte specific gene, and they showed that uh, the histology confirmed the presence of the ovarian tissue, and the patient conceived spontaneously and had, had a baby. This was the first publication, and the second one came, came from Israel, uh, and they're very, very good in cryopreservation in Israel. And they did new, it's a New England Journal of Medicine patient, and this was achieved uh, after first line of chemo, before the high dose chemo, and uh, they had two approaches. One, they took large slices and put into the ovary like this. The other one, they cut into two small pieces and injected. So this is one ovary, this is the right ovary. Only this one worked, only the large pieces worked. And they performed IVF and they resulted in a live birth. Now, this procedure is being done. More than 100 babies were born around the world. It's not the easiest thing to do, but it can be done. If we compare, all side freezing has left the conference. Over. Is it me? No, okay. We'll go over right this. So if you compare all side to ovarian tissue prior preservation, the important parts are all side freezing requires ovarian stimulation, so it may delay treatment. Uh, it, so it can require delay in the chemotherapy. 
but does not require surgery and does not have the risk of receding the cancer, which I guess would be a major issue for certain cancers that could you know, be um, present in the ovary. So that would be an issue for ovarian tissue. Mm -hmm. One important issue is the, whether it's appropriate in pre-puberty or not. And all side cry preservation you cannot do during pre-puberty. So if you have a young child coming, she's like 11 years old, the only thing you can offer is to freeze their ovaries. There's nothing else you can do. You can't get eggs from a pre-puberty girl or embryos. And resumption of endocrine function is another thing. When you put the ovarian tissue back, in addition to having a baby, you could also benefit from hormonal regulation. Okay, I'm with my music. The general score treatment is, I'm doing really good with the time though. This is the final thing. This is the only uh, treatment that doesn't require freezing. Something. Has joined the conference. Yeah, that's great. So we talk, we were going to talk about four things, right? The first three were freezing reproductive tissues, embryo, egg, or ovary. The fourth thing is not about freezing an ov a reproductive tissue, it's about giving a medication. And as I was telling Dr. Lillenbaum an hour ago, I work in a very simple field. It's only one axis, goes from the hypothalamus to the pituitary to the ovary to the uterus. I like it simple, that's why I went to OBGYN. Uh, and one of the regulatory hormones here is called gonadotropin releasing hormone. It goes from the hypothalamus to the pituitary. And what it does, when it goes in a wave-like fashion, it stimulates the pituitary to make the hormone uh, that causes egg growth. But if you took the same hormone from the hypothalamus and you gave it in a high steady dose, it suppresses everything and it puts you into menopause. So people thought, hmm, when in animals or in humans, it looks like when we give chemotherapy to prepubertal animals or humans, it seems to hurt less. So what if we put women into a menopausal state, would it help? Now this is really not based on a lot of science because the main follicles that are primordial follicles do not have receptors for FSH. So there's really no scientific reason for this to hurt. But in my field, we don't need that much. We, we can just give the medications to people without any. So they did. This is a GnRH agonist. So this is gonadotropin releasing hormone. It's only 10 amino acids. You change the number six or number 10 and you, cause, you make these medications. And when you inject these medications to the patient, it suppresses the whole axis. You go into menopause. Uh, and there's many, many, many studies showing that if you do give these patients, it helps women maintain their egg numbers. These are not very well designed studies. Most of them are not randomized controlled trials. Most of them use historic controls, but they do show a benefit. And why do we do that? It's because alkylating agents cause gonadotoxicity and uh, mainly cyclophosphamide that you seem to use for, especially for breast cancer patients. And interestingly, this has been shown in mouse as well as rhesus monkey. When you give uh, the GnRH agonist, the loss of fertility goes from 29%, I mean, from 65% to 29%. It does not protect, protect against radiotherapy. Importantly, the effect and impact of the chemotherapy, the negative effect of chemotherapy, is related to the age of the woman. And because chemo seems to kill a percentage of the eggs, so if you are young and have a lot of eggs and chemotherapy you know, destroys a large part of your eggs, you may still have quite a bit left to go to help you for a few years. So again, there are several studies that if you give uh, GnRH agonist co-treatment to woman who uses, who is under, who's getting gonadotoxic treatment for lupus, uh, it will help them um, prevent them getting into menopause. Um, so we know there's not enough really scientific evidence for this to have a central effect. And very recently, this got published a month ago, we checked every single pathway that could be activated by GnRH agonists in the ovary. And we found that none of them were activated. So we, we checked whether GnRH would have a direct effect in the ovary uh, for P38, the RAS pathway, or F1 or 2, but it did not. So as it stands, we still, a lot of people would still use this medication for patients who are about to start um, chemotherapy. 
You can give monthly preparations of 375 uh, milligram IM uh, around 10 days before the pulse, or you can do, give a depot preparation uh, for, and continue for a total of six months. Advantages are, this is simple. It is not cheap, but it's not really expensive compared to the other options. It has minimal side effects. It is not invasive, and there are promising preliminary results. Disadvantages, it doesn't work with radiotherapy. Re randomized controlled trials show inconsistent results, and molecular mechanism of action are unclear. So as it is, we go back to the beginning, we have four options. When a patient is referred to us, what we do is that we discuss with them what we can do for them. We, all, we explain to them each option, and then they choose. Many may choose not to do anything. Uh, some would choose, uh, many would choose all-site freezing. I think all-site freezing is becoming uh, the method of choice, surpassing embryo freezing these days. And many would also want to get the generation injection, understanding that there is not really scientific evidence for it to work. And some, only a few, would consider ovarian tissue freezing, especially prepubertal people. Uh, for a lot of the things that I said, we, we recently published a pretty detailed book on this. It's available for free. You can go on to the Yale website. I mean, Springer books are available for anyone who wants to read them, and each of these subjects are available. Now, I think I have time, though. Do I? Two minutes? You do. Okay, cool. So I just want to show you how it works in a clinical setting. I didn't know I was going to do this. So this is one a patient we treated who was uh, referred from uh, Yale Oncology. She was 17 years old, never been pregnant. She went to her doctor with a right groin mass. In April on April 3rd, uh, they removed the mass and diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma. April 27th, she underwent another surgery. They confirmed there was no remnant. She underwent a CT of chest, pelvis, abdomen, bone scans, and there was no sign of metastasis. They planned 14 cycles of chemotherapy alternating the following medications, vincristine, doxa, cyclophosphamide, uh, and ifosfamide and topozide, every three weeks. Uh, they called us May 5th, and those days we were not as good with the stimulation protocols. Uh, it's been a few years since then. And luckily, her last menstrual period was April 16, which made her day 20 of her cycle the best day we like for stimulation. <laughs> and and her first cycle chemo was started on May 4th and completed on the day of consultation. So we had three weeks to the next cycle. And we, we counseled the patient, decided to proceed with all site freezing. So the initial consult, May 5th, Lupron started May 6th. May 15th, we started FSH. May 30th, we got 43 eggs. Uh, and 32 of them were really good quality, so we froze them. She was able to attend her boyfriend's prom and make it on time to her second round of chemo. Uh, what I was trying, what, what I was telling Dr. Lillenbaum is that we do consider these patients as a medical emergency, although they're not. We see them within 48 hours uh, in our practice uh, and, um, and we start treating them right away. And another thing that I was reminded to remind you is that for women of reproductive age, it is uh, a medical legal liability not to mention that fertility preservation is available, and we see more and more cases these days. Thank you very much. But, but I thought your last slide would be a picture of a baby. <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. Okay. All right. We have time for one or two questions. So, Dr. Sant, as a breast cancer doctor, okay, we see a lot of young women with breast cancer and it's an area where estrogen stimulation would be a concern. How do you handle that from a clinical perspective? How do you integrate the two and what kinds of factors do you think patients, how do they weigh the different issues? Uh, so uh, while we appreciate the risk of um, extra estrogen in the system, for young patients, especially those with stage one through three, many of them will go on to live a long life. And so, uh, I think what we feel like in our breast center is that we owe them the uh, discussion with the fertility specialists and then they talk about the risks and the benefits for fertility preservation. My own personal feeling is that it's uh, worth to them their quality of life and potentially having kids later um, versus the small risk of a little bit of extra estrogen for a week or two while they're undergoing that. 
Maybe Art has another opinion, but that's how I feel. Art, another opinion? No, that's how you feel. Okay. Roger? So what's the actual success rate for these procedures? So what do you quote your patients when they come to you? Uh, and I don't know if it varies you know, that much between the different procedures. Does it vary with age? Does it vary with the type of chemo versus radiation? I mean, what, what, what is the essence of your conversation with these patients? So uh, the mathematical explanation of success rate is very complicated on infertility. I think the doctors make it that way. It's, it's better in a sense. For embryo transfer, frozen thawed embryo transfer, the numbers are thought of as pregnancy per transfer. And the number we quote is depending on age, but for a woman who is 37 or under, it would be 25% per transfer. When you do egg freezing, the number you quote is generally not pregnancy per transfer, it's generally baby per frozen egg. And that number, it will seem low, but it's not, it's six to eight percent. Because even when you do fresh IVF on a woman who has no issues, but her husband maybe, ha maybe her husband has some, you know, low sperm count, this, it's the same number. When we do IVF, we get 25 eggs. From 25 eggs, we get 18 embryos. Then the embryos, some of them die as they grow. Finally, transfer three and freeze a few. So at the end of the day, we generally get around eight babies for 100 eggs retrieved in the United States. And the, for the egg freezing, I explained to them that it's pretty similar from 6 to 8 percent. For ovarian tissue cryopreservation, we only tell them that there's only a few hundred babies around the world. So we can't really give a number. And for GNRH agonists, uh, the studies are not really good enough to allow us to quote a number. I, we would just tell them that their likelihood of uh, conserving their fertility is higher as their age goes down, and there's a potential that the medication can help, but we're not sure. So, Dr. Sally, one other question. Seeing Matt sitting here and seeing Roy Herb sitting here as well, one of the things I'm concerned about, it's, it's a little, it's very straightforward when the woman has, or the girl has a Ewing's or a young woman has breast. How does it impact you if the person has pancreas cancer, advanced pancreas cancer, or advanced melanoma, or advanced solid tumors, where, where the ultimate survival of the patient is not as clear as we have strong hope that this woman's going to be cured. Tara's patient who have, who have uh, breast cancer, we have strong hope they'll be cured. What about the woman with pancreas cancer who's 34? young woman who's got a horrible melanoma. How do you handle that? So that's a very good question, and I, I hope this goes well with you, but I have a very strong position on this as I have break. I also run the third party reproduction program. I work with same-sex couples. I work with people who have heart disease, etc. Our position is that we don't have really a strong opinion. We, we just try to basically provide the available opportunities to the patient and explain to them all the negative things that can happen. But we ask them to also meet with our psychologist who is uh, extremely experienced with us, Dorothy Greenfeld. She's a social worker. Uh, she, you know, she's quite well known in the field of complicated reproduction. And she goes uh, very, um, in a non-assuming way, she goes through all the options and she makes them ask the questions and make sure they have the responses. Uh, we do this also for third-party reproduction, which is even more complicated because when you freeze an egg, all you have is a frozen egg. Sometimes, you know, what if you actually generate, you know, have a baby and then the death occurs, which is an issue for, for example, older couples who want to have a baby. So we ask all those questions, uh, but we don't, we, we don't have a limit on saying if you are stage four pancreas cancer, we will not freeze your egg. We, we can't do that. Okay. 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 Art? You know, years ago, we used to tell women who had breast cancer never to get pregnant again. But that has changed tremendously, and uh, there's very little data that there's uh, increased risk for them. And the only thing that I used to do in the old days is if, if, if they wanted to get pregnant is suggest if they had a high-risk cancer, maybe wait a year or two just to make sure they're not going to um, progress in that period of time. Yeah, right. We were, I was taught the same thing. Yeah. Progression can be so late in breast cancer that I'm not sure that made a whole lot no of sense. sense. Great. Well, thank you very much. That was a terrific presentation. And while we switch.